writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read, writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truth, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time. And we'd love for you to join us. Welcome to Words to Write By. We have something a little different today. Last week, Renee and I were at the San Francisco Writers Conference, and there was a lot of discussion about writing craft and other more marketable things. We sat at a table for breakfast and talked to some of the other women that were at the table and discovered that, in fact, we are not the only people with way too many craft books. Apologies for the sound. I haven't recorded in the field in a while, and there was a lot of background, but here we go. I am Kimberly Haddad, and I'm here at the conference, and I definitely have a craft book addiction. Um, I probably have between 40 and 50 craft books, mostly about writing memoir. Hi, I'm Dordy Novak, and I own two bookshelves full of craft books, one of poetry and one of fiction. How long are these bookshelves? Like three feet? Um, I would say... Yeah, the width of this table. So, so I get a lot. My name's Deborah. And do you own any craft books? Probably about 60 or so. And how long does it take you to amass 60 craft books? Well, I gave away the first batch from my younger life, and then I reacquired and read once and thought they're wonderful, I need to keep them. But now all I do is clear things away, the feng shui of it all. I want to find a young writer's group to give them all to because I already read them. I'm divesting myself of the hoard. So, Doherty, how many of your books have you read all the way through? Um, not all of them. I have to be honest. I dipped here and there, but I look at them as reference books. So if there's something in particular I really want to know about, I can pull it out. So you've at least opened every one of them? Oh, yeah. So Kimberly, what keeps you going when you're reading a craft book? What keeps you engaged? It's the inspiration, especially the ones that have samples of other people's work. Like a lot of the authors will talk about their students' work and things like that. So seeing all of the things that they write, it's really inspiring to me. Sometimes it triggers different ideas for me in my own stories. So I think that's it. And then also I just really love learning and building my craft. What do you think causes you to buy craft books, Dorothy? Well, when I was in college, I studied and majored in English literature and also in poetry. But my focus was mainly on teaching, literary criticism. And when I decided that I wanted to write, I realized I didn't know the craft. So maybe I self-taught to a certain extent, although I have taken a lot of classes. Kimberly, when you read a book, do you use a highlighter or take notes in the margin? Never. I am. I cannot. If someone writes in a book, it makes my body just like get very uncomfortable. Do you take notes? I do, but in like a notebook, not in the actual book itself. <laughs> or I'll put little like post-it notes on certain pages that I want to go back on because I tend to read books more than once and I usually get something different from them every single time. What new books did you buy? Uh, on Writing by Stephen King and then I forgot the name of the other one. It was... Something the, something with the birds, I forget what it is. Deborah, did you buy any craft books this conference? No, no, I'm steering clear of the whole area because it can become an addiction. What's the most recent craft book you read? I reread The Art of Writing, a slim little volume that says everything you need to know. Okay, and do you know the author of that book? Uh, it'll come to me after I've had coffee. Doherty, how would you describe opening a brand new craft book? It's kind of like the first day of school. Thanks to all our table mates at the San Francisco Writer Conference. It was a great conversation. Oh, and one last thing. 
Just wanted to remind you that we've got a Patreon account with lots of cool stuff on it. We've got show notes and bonus episodes. Um, and I'll tell you more about this at the end of the show. This episode is all about cause and effect, what it is, why it's critical in fiction despite its absence in real life, and examining how it works line by line as stimulus and response. Jack Bickham has some hard rules for the order of stimulus, for internalization, and response, and we examine our own writing to see if it follows this format. Okay, let's start off with what is cause and effect? Uh, physics. <laughs> Actually, cause and effect is used all across sciences. We've discussed it quite a bit in biology. Well, what does it mean in biology? It's the same thing it means everywhere else, that one thing causes another. Ah, and in sciences, the question you're always asking, is it causality? Can you actually prove that one thing caused another or did they just both happen again? The classic one is um, in the summer, lots of people go to the beach and lots of people drink Coca-Cola. So the question is, does going to the beach cause people to drink lots of Coca-Cola? When in fact, no, it's just hot and they do both those things when it's hot. So the trick is to try to figure out whether or not an effect you're seeing in science is caused by the thing that you think it's causing or if it's even happening. Oh, there's a fallacy in writing. In Latin, I think it's ergo propter hoc or something. It's called correlation in time does not equal causation. Just because two things happen at the same time does not mean that they caused each other. Mm -hmm. Does this apply to fiction? Um, what does he say about it? Um, you got a quote here? Right. So in fiction, effects like plot developments must have causes, like background, and vice versa. If you want someone to fall ill and want the reader to believe it, you must first build in the background, perhaps a raging epidemic, a character who is overworked and wary, and who is also depressed enough to have a poorly functioning immune system. And then you have to provide the more immediate, present story time cause, the entering of the house, and finally, the deadly sneeze. So cause and effect. Effects are, he says, are the plot developments. It's the stuff that happens. And causes are the backgrounds causing things to happen. And because we're moving linearly through times, the plot that was happening last chapter becomes the background for what's happening in the next chapter. Yes. One of my favorite cause and effects is seen in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Because it's one of those books that feels completely random. And yet, part of the reason it works is that many of the things are a consequence of something that came before. So, Humorously. Yes. If you haven't read the book, it's a blast or seen the movie, but the book's way better. Are you going to give the example? So it starts off with the scene of Arthur Dent lying in front of his house in, in the mud in front of a bulldozer, which is one of those crazy things. And yet it makes perfect sense because, in fact, his house is scheduled for demolition. And the only way he can save his house is just lie in front of the bulldozer. And then and his friend comes and talks him to, to go away. And when Arthur goes away, the effect is that the bulldozer rams to his house. And this is just the setup for the bigger background, which is that the earth has been scheduled for demolition. And Arthur's friend, Ford, is in fact an alien. So those two bits of background combine are the reason why Arthur gets off the planet before the Earth is destroyed and has this wonderful adventure in space or crazy adventure in space. But it feels kind of random. Uh, Douglas Adam, who wrote this book, wanted some schlub to basically be kind of trapsizing through space that wasn't special or especially smart or adventurous or anything like that. In fact, he travels all the way through in his bathrobe. And that's another cause and effect. Arthur wears a bathrobe through the entire story because the background is that he wakes up in the morning and just barely catches the bulldozer from bulldozing his house. So he's still in this bathrobe. So a little bit of background here. I have a towel from my 42nd birthday, and so does my husband. That was a special birthday for both of us. So that's an example of the completely absurd story that still relies on cause and effect. Yes, as ridiculous as the causes were, the effects are equally as ridiculous, but that's why we love the story. Mm -hmm. So once you get cause and effect down, cause and effect is like this general principle. Things have to happen for a reason in a story. 
it's most often caused like, why did your character do that? Right. And there needs to be a reason. Bickham is very clear on this. Like, you cannot just hint at stuff. Like, it has to be clear why your character is doing something. And there's ways to reveal it, which we're going to get into a second. But what's really interesting is he gets really philosophical about this. <laughs> this idea makes a lot of sense, but it often runs up against especially beginning writers who say, well, I want it to be like real life. Things don't always have causes in real life. You know, I want the story just to happen naturally. And Bickham doesn't say, oh, no, in life there's cause and effect. He says, no, in life it's completely random. However, however, to the student, the 50th millionth student who's come up to me to say, this is how it happened in real life. And so I wrote it this way. <laughs> Bickham says, this kind of presentation shows a world in which things do make sense. The resulting story also has the effect of offering a little hope to the reader, a suggestion by implication that life doesn't have to be meaningless and that bad things don't always have to happen to good people for no reason. I suspect that when you write a story that makes sense through use of cause and effect, you are also implying somehow that life is worth living. So really what he's trying to say is there isn't a lot of meaning in life. People die and we just kind of like, why did this happen? And you could linger on that forever. And there isn't a cause. There's no reason for horrible things happening. But in a story, there is. And what's nice about that, Bickham says, is there is a reason for things going wrong or there is a reason for things going right. And that can give us a sense of peace of mind. And this actually harkens back to stuff we talked about Gardner, where he talked a lot about theme. What's the theme of your story? What is the lesson you're trying to impart? And through cause and effect, we can then have lessons. The world doesn't make sense. And people find refuge in stories that make sense. I have had that experience. Like when you get done with a book and it ends and you just feel like the world's a better place. Yeah. Because you've just seen everything fit together. Like the end of Lord of the Rings. That last scene always makes me cry. But it's because of all the things that came before it. And mm -hmm. it is like the perfect end result for Frodo. He can't handle it anymore and he has to leave. On a more upbeat one, Barbara King Solvers, The Bean Trees. It's a story that has a lot of things that all fall into place so that this woman can keep her adopted daughter. And she has the analogy of the bean trees and how beans, um, legumes, have a bacterial symbiosis where the bacteria fixes the nitrogen and allows them to grow. The two have to be with each other. And her story connects it to show how we all rely on other people. Right. You end it with like, wow, the world is connected and people are helping other people and affecting their lives. And it feels really good. Yeah. And for memoirists like myself, this is a really good lesson because, again, weird stuff happens in our life and we want to write about it but there has to be causes and there has to be effects for the reader to get it or to come away with some kind of lesson from our experiences so i think this chapter is very important for memoirists i'm gonna argue that i have also had books that i loved where completely random things happen and things aren't connected some writers will do this well enough that they will introduce some random element to the story and it almost kind of cleanses the feeling. Otherwise, you are picking up all the cues. You actually know what some very common causes are and what their effects are. So like if you are watching a movie where there's a woman that takes her child to the playground and then she gets distracted by her cell phone and walks away, you know that that kid is going to either fall off an equipment or someone's going to abduct them. Right. And this is reinforced through the music and things like that. But there's a certain amount of automatic response to things. And it's kind of nice when something completely different happens or random. And maybe the author does have a deeper reason for that stuff happening. So if you actually look at the book as a whole, in the end, you can say, oh, there was this cause here. We just weren't told about it until the very end. Oh, it's like Fight Club. Right? Like ha suddenly, like three quarters of the book, it all, all the dominoes fall and you're like, oh my God. And that's what every writer wants to put in place. So for majority of fiction, it's even more critical that you have 
a cause or a background that you're going to reveal at a certain point. Right. You don't want to do the deus ex machina thing where stuff happens out of nowhere. It's not very entertaining for the reader. So first off, Bickham establishes cause and effect as this is something that needs to happen in stories for readers to go along for the ride and to make sense of the events that are taking place. But then he gets a little bit more specific as to the strategy that you need to use or how it plays out in the prose of a scene. And he calls this stimulus and response. Which are also often used in science as well. And stimulus really? and response is more quick acting. I add this concentration of food to a solution of bacteria and you see the bacteria move towards the food. You shake the treat bag and my cats come running yeah. knowing what they're about to get. Very Pavlovian. I get it. Pavlov. All right. Just letting you know, not all of us are scientists. <laughs> yes, but everyone's heard of Pavlov and his dogs. That's true. So stimulus and response are how it takes place in a story. It's also a strategy of something that you put in the writing so that cause and effect can take place for the reader. Jack Bickham says that stimulus and response are cause and effect made more specific and immediate. They're like the physical part of cause and effect. He gives the example of going through one of his own scenes and basically pinpointing this is a stimulus this is the response, and he, he breaks it all down. So you should be able to look at a couple of pages of a book, and you should be able to pick up on these elements as you're going through those pages. It doesn't have to be chapters and chapters. It can be a single page. He does a really good job of giving very simple examples and things where it goes wrong. So he goes, stimulus. Joe threw the ball to Sam. That is stimulus. And then there's a variety of ways that the response could happen. Sam could catch it. Sam dropped it. Sam didn't see it. It hit him in the nose. Okay, cool. But what if Joe threw the ball to Sam and then the writer then writes, Sam asked, hey, what you doing today? It's implied, perhaps, that Sam caught the ball. But the reader still needs to see it play out. They still need to see it happen, that he caught the ball there's something in their brain they're gonna know something was missing and then you're starting to break the disbelief you're starting to break that dream the reader's dream that Gardner talks about right they're knocked out of the story because they're not listening to the dialogue they're thinking where did that ball go right and then it goes even further you don't have to have the response be so immediate to the cause. For example, you could have some background that explains a later response. So his example was uh, of a mistake of this is Mary walked into the party. Oh no, Julie groaned. You're like, why is Julie saying, oh no? <laughs> well, if you put in some background, that would give the reader what they need to understand Julie's response to the stimulus of Mary walking into the party. So it comes to, Mary walked into the party wearing a strapless blue gown. Oh no, Julie, wearing an identical dress, groaned and ran for the exit. Right. And that's pretty basic. Um, then there is another element because not everything is external. Not everything is one person does this and one person does that. And in fact, if you have a story that's just that, well, you, you have Hemingway, but you... <laughs> Um, I was going to back up and say, I think that actually stimulus and response happens all the time between people. It's just that we don't understand. Like someone says one word and it sets the other person off. And we don't know why, which is why it seems random to us. But in fact, there's a really good reason why that word set that person off. They might not even know it. But as writers, we get to fill in that blank by its inner thoughts, or he calls it internalization. Internalization, yeah. It's where... The receiving character thinks and feels before they have their response, which explains the response that they're going to have. And readers like that. We like being in the character's heads as part of the experience of reading a story. In fact, the most common style of writing right now is called close third person, which means that we don't have eyes. We have he did, he said, he thought. 
but we only follow one person. So we get right into what they're thinking when someone says something or when they see something or some aspect. So that would be the internalization. Yeah, we have an episode on point of view, by the way, you can find that on our website. Um, it didn't deal with Gardner and, and I have all the point of views mapped out. Um, but yeah, that is a very popular one right now where you stick to one. Here, here is an example without the internalization. Nancy, the chairman said, we have decided to make you a vice president of the firm. Oh, no, Nancy said. How could I have such bad luck? <laughs> the internalization that would explain Nancy's strange response has been omitted. So what do we do? <laughs> you put in some thoughts. So it doesn't make any sense why Nancy's responding this way. In fact, as Bickham does in a very long paragraph, he goes into an example, like what if she thought this was a dead-end job, she just interviewed at another place, and she'd accepted it, and she was going to tell everybody that she was given her two weeks notice, and this happens. Right. It's important also to note that it all has to be in the correct order. You have to have the stimulus to have the response. You can't have the response first and then the stimulus, or it's just not going to make any sense. And what's really interesting, the way he writes this, he does not mince words. Like, I swear, I think I wrote like three pages of or four pages of notes for just a 10 page chapter because everything he says is so clear. You're very advanced in your note taking, though. Well, I wouldn't say advanced. Maybe I would say obsessive. But this reminds me of when I teach paragraph development in my courses, when I tell students, you know, they need to have some kind of topic sentence for a paragraph, and then they have to have some kind of evidence, and then they have to have some kind of, you know, logic or explanation trying to persuade the reader. You can't have the persuasion come before the evidence, because if you don't have evidence, you can't persuade. Like, there's a certain order in which people need events. And it's the same with sentences. If you write in the passive, you're putting the subject of the sentence at the end of the sentence. You don't know who's speaking until the end or doing the action, and actions don't do themselves. So I can totally see how this is working on a, at an event level in a scene, because that's just how our brains work when we read. This is one of those skills that when you lay it out like that, it seems obvious this is how someone should write because this is how we see the world. This isn't like some sort of, I got to invert my brain to think another way when I'm writing as opposed to the way things really happen. Once you've mastered this, then this becomes the default. And it really, when you're reading something through, even if you make a mistake the first time, you catch it right away. What's interesting is as much as I like harp on my students about the order of things and how we think when we're reading and what order we need them, I myself actually have a really hard time while I'm writing, I spend a lot of time wondering about when should I reveal things. And this chapter, I think finally just kind of broke it down for me and answered my own question. <laughs> and, and the answer is? And the answer is there is an order to which you have to reveal things. And sometimes it seems like things are happening at the same time in a story because they are in real life. But the reader can't have that. And they have to be in the correct order so they could see the scene play out in, in their imagination. To me, I mean, the light went on when I was reading this. I was like, oh, I get it. Okay. Which also makes me think it's going to take me a while to start writing my scenes in this new way. Where it's like if I'm writing an action scene and things are happening, I have to really like think about, okay, who did what first? What caused this to happen? When I'm writing, I sometimes need to stand up and actually physically do something. Like when I was writing my paragraph the other day about Sufi up in the tower, you know, I had to actually pretend I was leaning out to figure out, well, when do I move my hand? Oh, or yeah, that's a good strategy. One of the times I was trying to figure out how to make a kissing scene. <laughs> Magic really enjoyed that research. Aww. The next thing that Bickham does is he breaks down one of his scenes in, a, in Appendix 2. But um, I think it's fun to get something a little different. So Renee found a book that's in public domain. And why don't you just read through what you've got? Okay, so I've got a scene or a section of a book from Call of the Wild, Jack London. I don't know if anyone's read Call of the Wild since like middle school, but man, he is both philosophical and yet his action scenes are just amazing. 
and he immediately came to mind when I'm like, okay, I need to find an example. I'm like, well, he had those great dog on dog scenes. So the main character is Buck. He's a dog, obviously. And it's from the point of Buck. And then a nemesis. So one of the key elements of this chapter two is since you need a cause and effect and a stimulus and response, you need probably two characters or something at odds with a main character. And so I picked a scene that had Buck and Spitz and Spitz is another dog on the sled team. Should I read my analysis of it with the text? How long is your analysis? It's just labeling. Go for it. At first... London includes a little bit of background, a little bit of philosophy background that becomes the cause for a later event. Buck was sounding the deeps of his nature and of the parts of his nature that were deeper than he, going back into the womb of time. He was mastered by the sheer surging of life, the tidal wave of being, the perfect joy of each separate muscle, joint, and sinew, in that it was everything that was not death, that it was a glow and rampant, expressing itself in movement, flying exultantly under the stars and over the face of dead matter that did not move. Now, dear listener, more background, which will, in, uh, which becomes cause later on. But Spitz, cold and calculating, even in his supreme moods, left the pack and cut across a narrow neck of land where the creek made a long bend around. Buck did not know of this more background response. So first there's the background, you know, Spitz was cold and calculating in a supreme mood, right? But Buck didn't know it. So cause as Buck rounded the bend, the frost wraith of a rabbit still flitting before him, he saw another and larger frost wraith leap from the overhanging bank into the immediate path of the rabbit. It was Spitz. The rabbit could not turn, and as the white teeth broke its back in midair, it shrieked as loudly as a stricken man may shriek. Stimulus. At sound of this, the cry of life plunging down from life's apex into the grip of death, the full pack at Buck's heels, raised a hell's chorus of delight. So note how the background in the very beginning of the first paragraph comes in later to explain how the full pack is raised at hell's course of delight. Response, Buck did not cry out. He did not check himself, but response, drove in upon Spitz, shoulder to shoulder. Stimulus, so hard that he missed the throat. Response, they rolled over and over in the powdery snow. Stimulus, Spitz gained his feet almost as though he had not been overthrown slashing Buck down the shoulder and, response, leaping clear. Stimulus, twice his teeth clipped together like the steel jaws of a trap. Response, as he backed away for better footing with lean and lifting lips that writhed and snarled. I think it's really critical in things like fight scenes because it's one thing to the other and back and forth. And if you only were seeing one side of this fight or you weren't seeing the effect of the lunges then it it wouldn't play out. Right. So that's the key here for me anyway, as a writer, is I can describe things pretty clearly. In fact, I tend to over-describe. But here, what's happening has to be in the correct order, even within a sentence. So, for example, they rolled over and over in the powdery snow. Spitz gained his feet. So first they rolled over. Then Spitz gained his feet, almost as though he had not been overthrown. Then he slashed at Buck down the shoulder. And then Buck leaped clear. And that's two sentences. Right. Like, But the thing is, like, say they're rolling over and over again. And then you have Buck continue to roll over. And we don't mention that Spitz has gotten up. And then Spitz is lunging. So you need to have those in the order. like, Because we're assuming that Buck is still rolling because Spitz is the one to get up. Or Buck is still down. But if you were talking about Buck being down, you didn't properly set it up that Spitz had gotten up at that point to attack. You wouldn't be able to see where all this is happening. Right. And... Readers read because they want to see a cool action scene like this. I mean, that's why we read Call of the Wild, right? Like, he's got these awesome action scenes. So don't skimp on it. 
by not including responses or making assumptions that the reader's just going to see what you want them to see. I mean, here's the irony. So much time is spent to get all the right nuance of an action scene right, to have all this cause and effect, but it's at the point where people are most likely to read the most quickly through the book because they want to find out what happens. And so it's even more critical that you have this all lined up because they might not be carefully paying attention to this stuff. So if you do mess up a stimulus response, then it's totally going to throw them for a loop because they're not using their full brain to figure out how it's all going because they're so excited to see what happens at the end. Yes, you're high energy as a reader. But keep in mind also there's another tactic here and maybe another book that we read soon might be about crafting sentences. If you ever read action scenes, you'll notice a lot more verbal and sentence techniques to speed the sentence along. So there's a lot more um, shorter sentences and there's a lot more like sentence combining with verbs um, to speed the reader through it to give the sense that things are happening quickly. There's a lot of effects going on in a cool action scene. When you start digging down to what the sentence is, what the words, what the, oh, how it all plays together, it makes your brain spin. But luckily, All we need to worry about is cause and effect or stimulus and response and internalization. And that brings us to our exercise of the week, which is Renee and I are each going to take one of our scenes that we like, and we're just going to break it down the same way. We're going to identify the stimuluses, the responses, the internalizations, and, you know, and, and possibly some other things in the mix too. I truly believe that this stuff This cause and effect stuff is the same as when we read memoir. I mean, if you think of the last time you read a memoir, it reads a lot like a novel, depending on the type you're writing. Mine does kind of not do that all the time because sometimes they're essay-like, but I still think that this stuff applies to the real life inside your memoir because nobody would read your story if it wasn't organized like a story. Unless you're famous. Unless you're famous, and to that I am not. The other awesome thing about this exercise is that we don't necessarily have to write anything new. That's true. It's revision. Okay, let's go for it. Welcome back, dear listener, and on to the activity. Kim, you ready to read your piece? Yeah, I got it right here. I'm just going to read it all the way through, and then we can talk about it after that. Sounds good. So this takes place in my fantasy world, and the setup is that Sufi, who is a mage, has let the heroes out of the portal when she wasn't supposed to, and now she's got caught, and she's talking to Lenora, who's the magistrate, the person in charge, and the person that told Sophie not to let the heroes out. Let's go to my office, Sufi. Lenora's tone was soft. Sufi still felt like she was being led to the gallows. Up in her office, Lenora motioned for Sufi to sit in the high-backed chair closest to her desk. Then she went about busying herself like Sufi wasn't there. She shut the heavy wooden door, opened the shutter windows, examined a stack of papers before finally seating herself behind her desk. She still didn't look at Sufi. Instead, she dipped her quill and began to write. Scritch, scritch, scritch went the quill. It was the scratching that finally drew Sufi to talk. You said you wanted to discuss something? Yes, your punishment. Community service. I'm finishing the orders, so you can start right away. Scritch. Scritch. Wait, what? Now? Of course, she should have expected this. Lenora was going to saddle her with some cleaning or organizing task that would take up all her time, and by the time she finished, the heroes would be gone. Yes, now. It's a time-limited project that can't be put off. But... Sufi could feel the tears forming. She didn't want to cry, but this was too much. Sufi, actions have consequences. You're old enough to know that. Yes, Sufi replied. Lenora handed Sufi the parchment she'd been writing. Sufi braced herself for a week of filing papers in an isolated room. By order of Magistrate Nevins, it read, followed by the usual official proclamation text that Sufi skimmed until she saw her name. Second-level mage Sufi Ravanos is hereby assigned as liaison to the other worlders for the whole of their stay in Inanak. Her duties will include, but not necessarily be limited, to caring for their well-being 
educating them in the ways and histories of Mazajan and preparing them for their duties as heroes of the realm. Sufi reread the document carefully this time. But I thought the mayor was going to cart them around like show ponies. Yes, that's likely his plan, Lenora sighed. Galen means well, but using the other worlders to boost the local economy is short sighted. At best, they look the part and make fools out of themselves. At worst, it might hinder their ability to fulfill the divine wisdom's quest, a quest that isn't going to be an Inanak. Sufi knew that, as much as part of her would like the mayor to keep the heroes around. So, you want me to make sure he doesn't keep them here? That they're on the boat in four days? No, Lenora shook her head empathetically. I can get them on the boat. No, what I need is for you to make sure they're proper heroes, not just some other worlders playing dress up. The fighter and ranger need to know how to use their weapons. The rogue, well, honestly, it would probably be best if he was just playing dress up, but the magic users need to be able to cast spells. I don't want the wizard waving his wand around and messing up the spell. I need your experience. My experience casting spells that don't work? Oh, for the love of Ferhalti. At least Lenora was back to being exasperated, which Sufi felt, felt was normal. Your grandmother was a sorceress who campaigned with the Knights of Excalibur, the greatest heroes in recent memory. Your uncle told me you were fascinated by her stories, that she even took you to meet the paladin Martin Wu. According to your transcripts, Lenore shifted through the paperwork on her desk, you took metamagics of other worlds and apparently got top marks. That's more experience than the rest of the town combined. But it was too good to be true. It had to be a trap. But what if I... What was the term the heroes had used? Mess up? So the nature of this activity is a little different than the ones we've done in the past because there's this like sentence level analysis that Bickham did and that we had to pay attention to. Is there any way you could pick a paragraph in that piece and like tell us the response and stimulus that was going on? Okay, so starting close to the beginning, uh, after Sufi asks what her punishment is you can start right away and then that is the stimulus sufi will need to start her punishment then we get her immediate response wait what now and then i have an internalization lenore was going to saddle her with some kind of cleaning so that's what sufi is thinking and that's how we justify that wait what now and then lenore responds yes I think when you're doing dialogue back and forth, there's a lot of someone says a stimulus and someone responds as a yes or no answer, but response is yes. Lenore is still speaking. It's a time-limited project that can't be put off. And then to that, Sufi says, but, because, you know, a response again. And then I had, Sufi could feel the tears forming. And that's a physical response to the whole situation. So as you can see, mostly it's response at the beginning of the dialogue, and then it goes to some stimulus that sets off the next response. Well, yeah, it looks like you've got it in order, right? So Bickham was talking about how it needs to be in the correct order. So you'd have a stimulus and response. And you've got various things that Sufi is responding to. You've got, yes, your punishment, community service. You can start right away. Like that is a direct stimulus threat. And Sufi, you could hear it in her voice how she's like, wait, what now? She's angry and she's she's being provoked. Mm -hmm. And then, well, yes, now it's time for a limited promise that can't be put off. So that's adding like that time. The clock is ticking and it's kind of putting uh, Sufi in a box. The level of tension is increasing as the conversation takes place. So I think you did it. I think you've got the stimulus and response in order and in the way it's supposed to be that Bickham was talking about. The kind of cool thing about stimulus response is unlike a lot of techniques that are very nebulous, like theme or emotion or higher level things, stimulus response is just nuts and bolts. Like you identify what the stimulus is and you identify the response and you make sure that one comes after the other. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of paragraph development that I teach in, in my classes. Very, you know, topic sentence, evidence, analysis. Here it's like cause and effect, stimulus, response, internalization, background, 
response, right? Like you don't see that. You don't see it in the background. Like a reader wouldn't think, oh, she's following a certain order. You're doing the work that the reader doesn't see, right? Which is really cool. I remember when I had that being taught how to do paragraphs, I always got very frustrated because it seemed so obvious. And often you had to use the same keywords and it just felt like everyone's paragraph ended up looking very similar because it had all those same words even. But with fiction stuff, you can use stimulus and response in all sorts of contexts. Well, I think what you did really well here was that it's not just them taking turns. Um, you're upping the tension, like they're baiting each other. It's like poking the bear. You're like poking Sophie and she's reacting. And then it's like increasing over time. It's the the content. That's the difference between cause and effect and stimulus response. Cause and effect are the guidelines. It's the order. But stimulus response is the content. And I think you did that really well. How did you write this? Like, what was your process? Was this already written first? This was written first. I didn't actually have to change anything when I was looking at the exercise, but the process of writing it is a lot of iteration. A lot of one person saying something, writing the line of response of dialogue, and then at a certain point realizing I'm kind of going off the rails because overall this dialogue has several different parts. We start with just the, the telling Sufi what her punishment is. Then we have the shift to finding out that it's a different punishment than she thought. And then it's question, well, why did you put me in charge here? And then finally, there's the whole shift to explaining why Lenora put her in charge. And I wanted to make sure it never petered off or went off on a tangent but that it always stayed very tightly to what I wanted to cover. I don't want to have any more dialogue than I need in a scene. Okay. And I don't want to have any point where the dialogue gets boring. Right. So you were using this stimulus response like while you were writing it as like cues Mm -hmm. to up the tension. Interesting. And I'll run the dialogue through my head while I'm doing it. Like I can hear how one person says something and then figure out what the other person's response is going to be. And you're right. It's an escalation, but it's also um, a modulation where you can't go too emotional because then you have to bring it back down again. I think Bickham would be proud. (laughs) This is well done. You know, I think he'd be proud that his method works so well, too. I think this is evidence that it works even in something that's not a classic adventure story or... Uh, Some of the examples he gives are pretty hard boiled, you know. I think the most common issue with dialogue is people use it without any reason. You know, hello, how's it going? Oh, yeah. Hey, did you da 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 da? And that gets you nowhere. And and it's not the way people speak in real life. Mm -hmm. So, this is one of the things that probably helps to watch a lot of television because people in television shows talk like this quite a bit. That is true. This would help with screenwriting, wouldn't it? Yeah, or your screenwriting helps with with dialogue. What do you think? Any more questions? I think that's pretty good. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have, Renee. Do you have a lot of dialogue in your piece? Bickham had like two examples. He had a dialogue heavy one with exchanges, and then he had like an action scene, like a car chase. Mine is more like the car chase where there's action going on. But now reading yours, I kind of want to look at mine again and like (laughs) (laughs) fix it a little bit. I personally have issues with cause and effect or stimulus and response. I invested a lot of my time into sentence level stuff, like for poetry. So this bigger stuff, I I don't know what I want to call it, bigger stuff, structural stuff, I didn't put as much time into it as a writer. And so now it's coming to roost. (laughs) We'll have to check out yours in our bonus podcast, which we're going to be a little late on this week. So that will be coming up next week. So uh, for our Patreon listeners, they'll get that next week. Right. And for also people checking out the Patreon site and the website in general, I'd like to point out that Renee has been doing an amazing job going through and removing all the little inconsistencies and aspects that we maybe didn't get quite hammered out the first time we posted everything. So we have a very consistent website and a very consistent Patreon account. We're in the midst of the consistent 
Patreon account. But the website is much more consistent than it used to be. So if you go to Patreon, you get our bonus podcasts. And also you'll you'll get Renee's Snark Notes, which we now have for all of the art of fiction and the Bradbury. Yeah, the Zen and the Art of Writing. Mm-hmm. And, and we're caught up on uh, scene and structure. So it's all there. Okay. Anyone else that can support us, Renee? You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Those go a long way. And we will also read it on the air <laughs> if you leave us a really nice review on Apple Podcasts. And also, if you could please, if you know any writer friends, please share the work that we're doing with them. If you feel that it's valuable for them, we feel we put a lot of energy into analyzing these books and we hope that it's a good resource for writers. And we were passing out tons of bookmarks at the San Francisco Writers Conference two weekends ago. So if you received a bookmark and you've come to listen to to the podcast, we'll have a special shout out for anyone who got one of our bookmarks and came to the podcast on our website. And that's at words to write by podcast.com. And if you sign up for our newsletter, you get our most famous snark note collection of John Gardner's Common Errors with lots of examples and explanations of what he felt were the most common errors that fiction writers had. We weren't always very kind to Gardner, but we did agree that his common errors were a pretty solid addition to the book. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much and take care. We will be back in two weeks time. Bye-bye. Bye. Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim Smigato. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. Is it happening? It's happening. It looks like it's happening. Woot. <laughs>